Hello, everyone, and welcome to our next reading. Um, honestly, I was supposed to stream today, but the internet's out, so I'm like, hey, let's do a recording. And um, so, yeah, I'm going to start on the next book. If you haven't seen uh, my previous reading of um, Harry Pratchett's Small Gods, I would say to hit this link up here, which should lead to the first uh, video of that. Um, not that... All of the Discworld uh, books are loosely connected. Like, they're all in the same universe, but there's not really a specific timeline in which they each need to happen. Um, so you could read all of them independently, and they'd all still make perfect sense. Um, but yeah, that's just one of my favorites, so i definitely check it out. Uh, the one I'm going to read today is another one of my favorites, possibly my, my top uh, book uh, recommendation from Terry Pratchett, Reaper Man. It's very, very good. But uh, enough of that. Let me go ahead and uh, get started on this. And uh, I hope you guys enjoy the reading. <clears throat> the Morris Dance is, a com is common to all inhabited worlds in the multiverse. It is danced under blue skies to celebrate the quickening of the soil under bare stars because it's springtime and with any luck, the carbon dioxide will unfreeze again. The imperative is felt by deep-sea beings who have never seen the sun and urban humans whose only connection with the cycles of nature is that their Volvo once ran over a sheep. It is danced innocently by raggedy-bearded young mathematicians to an inexpert accordion rendering of Mr. Widgery's Lodger and ruthlessly by such as the Ninja Morris men of New Ankh who can do strange and terrible things with a simple handkerchief and a bell. And it is never danced properly. Except on the disc world, which is flat and supported on the backs of four elephants which travel through space on the shell of a great of great atun, uh, the world turtle. And even there, only in one place have they got it right. It's a small village high in the Ramtop Mountains, where the big and simple secret is handed down across the generations. There, the men dance on the first day of spring, backwards and forwards, bells tied under their knees, white shirts flapping. People come and watch. There's an ox roast afterward, and it's generally considered a nice day out for all the family. But that isn't the secret. The secret is the other dance. And that won't happen for a while yet. There's a ticking, such as might be made by a clock. And indeed, in the sky there is a clock, and the ticking of freshly minted seconds flows out from it. At least, it looks like a clock. But it is, in fact, exactly the opposite of a clock, and the biggest hand goes around just once. There is a plane under a dim sky. It is covered with gentle rolling curves that might remind you of something else if you saw it from a long way away. And if you did see it from a long way away, you'd be very glad that you were, in fact, a long way away. Three gray figures floated just above it. Exactly what they were can't be described in normal language. Some people might call them cherubs, although there was nothing rosy-cheeked about them. They might be numbered among those who see to it that gravity operates and that time stays separate from space. Call them auditors. Auditors of reality. They were in conversation without speaking. They didn't need to speak. They just changed reality so they had spoken. One said, It has never happened before. Can it be done? One said, It will have to be done. There is a personality. Personalities come to an end. Only forces endure. It said this with a certain satisfaction. One said, Besides, there have been irregularities. Where you get personality, you get irregularities. Well-known fact. One said, He has worked inefficiently? One said, No, we can't get him there. One said, That is the point. The word is him. Becoming a personality is inefficient. We don't want it to spread. Supposing gravity developed a personality. Supposing it decided to like people. One said, Got a crush on them sort of thing? One said, in a voice that would have been even chillier if it was not already an, at absolute zero, no. One said, sorry, just my little joke. One said, besides, sometimes he wonders about his job. Such speculation is dangerous. One said, no argument there. One said, then we are agreed? One, who seemed to have been thinking about something, said, just one moment. Did you not just use the singular pronoun my? Not developing a personality, are you? 
One said guiltily, who, uh, us? One said, where there is personality, this is dis there is discord. One said, yes, yes, very true. One said, all right, but watch it in future. One said, then we are agreed. They looked up at the face of Azrael, outlined against the sky. In fact, it was the sky. Azrael nodded slowly. One said, very well, where is this place? One said, it is the disc world. It rides through space on the back of a giant turtle. One said, oh, of that sort. I hate them. One said, you're doing it again. You said I. One said, no, no, I didn't. I never said I. Oh, bugger. It burst into flame and burned in the same way that a small cloud of vapor burns, quickly and with no residual mess. Almost immediately, another one appeared. It was identical in appearance to its vanished sibling. Let that be a lesson. To become a personality is to end. And now, let us go. Azrael watched them skim away. It is hard to fathom the thoughts of a creature so big that, in real space, his length would be measured only in terms of the speed of light. But he turned his enormous bulk and, with eyes that stars could be lost in, sought among the myriad worlds for a flat one, on the back of a turtle, the disc world. World and mirror of worlds. Sounds interesting. And in his prison of a billion years, Azrael was bored. And this is the room where the future pours into the past via the pinch of the now. Timers line the walls, not hourglasses, although they have the same shape, not egg timers, such as you might buy as a souvenir attached to a small board with the name of the holiday resort of your choice jauntily inscribed on it by someone with the same sense of style as a jelly donut. It's not even sand in there, it's seconds endlessly turning into the, the maybe into the was. And every life timer has a name on it. And the room is full of the soft hissing of people living. Picture the scene. And now, add the sharp clicking of bone on stone, getting closer. A dark shape crosses the field of vision and moves up the endless shelves of sibilant glassware. Click, click. Here's a glass with the top bulb nearly empty. Bone fingers rise and reach out, select, and another, select, and more, many, many more. Select, select. It's all in a day's work, or it would be if days existed here. Click, click as the dark shape moves patiently along the rows and stops and hesitates. Because here's a small gold timer, not much bigger than a watch. It wasn't there yesterday or wouldn't have been if yesterday's existed here. Bony fingers close around it and hold it up to the light. It's got a name on it in small capital letters. The name is Death. Death put down the timer, then picked it up again. The sands of time were already pouring through. He turned it over experimentally, just in case. The sand went on pouring, only now it was going upward. He hadn't really expected anything else. It meant that, even if tomorrow's could exist here, there wasn't going to be any. Not anymore. There was a movement in the air behind him. Death turned slowly and addressed the figure that wavered indistinctly in the gloom. Why? It told him, but that is not right. It told him that no, it was right. Not a muscle moved on Death's face, because he hadn't got any. I shall appeal. It told him he should know that there was no appeal. Never any appeal. Never any appeal. Death thought about this, and then he said, I have always done my duty as I saw fit. The figure floated closer. It looked vaguely like a gray-robed and hooded monk. It told him, we know. That is why we're letting you keep the horse. The sun was near the horizon. The shortest-lived creatures on the disc were mayflies, which barely made it through 24 hours. Two of the oldest zigzagged aimlessly over the waters of a trout stream, discussing history of s with some younger members of the evening hatching. You don't get the kind of sun now that you used to get, said one of them. You're right, we had proper sun in the good old hours. It were all yellow, none of this red stuff. And it were higher, too. It was, you're right. And nymphs and larvae showed you a bit of respect. And they did, they did, said the other mayfly vehemently. 
I reckon if mayflies these hours behaved a bit better, we'd have be having proper sun. The younger mayflies listened politely. I remember, said one of the oldest mayflies, when this was all fields as far as you could see. The younger mayflies looked around. It's still fields, one of them ventured after a polite interval. I remember when it was better fields, said the old mayfly sharply. Yeah, said his colleague, and there was a cow. That's right. You're right. I remember that cow. Stood right over there for, oh, 40, 50 minutes. It was brown, as I recall. You don't get cows like that these hours. You don't get cows at all. What's a cow? said one of the hatchlings. See? said one of said the oldest mayfly triumphantly. That's modern eph Oh god. Ephemeroptera for you. It paused. What were we doing before we were talking about the sun? Uh zigzagging aimlessly over the water, said one of the young flies. This was a fair bet in any case. No, no, before that. Uh, you were telling us about the great trout. Ah, yes, right, the trout. Well, you see, if you've been a good mayfly, zigzagging up and down properly, taking heed of your elders and betters, yes, taking heed of your elders and betters, then eventually the great trout... Clop, clop. Yes, said one of the younger mayflies. There was no reply. The, the, the great trout what? Said another mayfly nervously. They looked down at a series of expanding concentric rings on the water. The holy sign, said a mayfly. Now I remember being told about that. The great circle in the water. Thus shall be the sign of the great trout. The oldest of the young mayflies watched the water thoughtfully. It was beginning to realize that, as the most senior fly present, it now had the privilege of hovering closest to the surface. Uh, they say, said the mayfly at the top of the zigzagging crowd, that when the great trout comes for you, you go to a land flowing with, uh, flowing with, mayflies don't eat. It was at a loss. Uh, flowing with water, it finished lamely. I wonder, said the oldest mayfly. It must be really good there, said the youngest. No, why? Because no one ever wants to come back. Whereas the oldest things on the disc world were the famous counting pines, which go right on the permanent snow line of the high ram top mountains. The counting pine is one of the few known examples of borrowed evolution. Most species do their evolving, making it up as they go along, which is the way nature intended. And this is all very natural and organic and in tune with mysterious cycles of the cosmos, which believes that there's nothing like millions of years of really frustrating trial and error to give a species moral fiber and, in some cases, backbone. This is probably fine from the species point of view, but from the perspective of the actual individuals involved, it can be a real pig, or at least a small pink root-eating reptile that might one day evolve into a real pig. So the counting pines avoided all this by letting other vegetables do their evolving for them. A pine seed, coming to rest anywhere on the disc, immediately picks up the most effective local genetic code via morphic resonance and grows into whatever best suits the soil and climate, usually doing much better at it than the native trees themselves, which it usually usurps. What makes the counting pines particularly noteworthy, however, is the way they count. Being dimly aware that human beings had learned to tell the age of trees by counting the rings, the original counting pines decided that this was why humans cut trees down. Overnight, every counting pine readjusted its genetic code to produce, at about eye level on its trunk, in pale letters, its precise age. Within a year, they were felled almost into extinction by the ornamental house numbers plate industry, and only a very few survive in hard-to-reach areas. The six counting pines in this clump were listening to the oldest, whose gnarled trunk declared it to be 31,734 years old. The conversation took 17 years, but has been speeded up. I remember when this wasn't fields. The pines stared out over a thousand miles of landscape. The sky flickered like a bad special effect from a time travel movie. Snow appeared, stayed for an instant, then melted. What was it then? said the nearest pine. Nice! If you can call it ice, we had proper glaciers in those days. Not like the ice you get now, here one season and gone the next, and hung around for ages. Uh, what happened to it then? It went. Uh, went where? Where things go. Everything's always rushing off. Wow, that was a sharp one. Uh, what was? That winter just then. Call that a winter? When I was a sapling, we had winters. 
Then the tree vanished. After a shocked pause for a couple of years, one of the clumps said, He just went, just like that. One day he was here, next he was gone. If the other trees had been humans, they would have shuffled their feet. It happens, lad, said one of them carefully. He's been taken to a better place. In this case, three better places. The front gates of numbers 31, 7, and 34 Elm Street, Ankh Mapork. You can be sure of that. He was a good tree. The young tree, which was a mere 5,111 years old, said, What sort of a better place? We're not sure, said one of the clump. It trembled uneasily in a week long gale, but we think it involves sawdust. Since the trees were unable to even sense any event that took place in less than a day, they never heard the sound of axes. Wendell Poons, oldest wizard in the entire faculty of the Unseen University, home of magic, wizardry, and big dinners, was also going to die. He knew it in a frail and shaky sort of way. Of course, he mused as he wheeled his wheelchair over the flagstones toward the ground, his ground floor study in a general sort of way everyone knew they were going to die, even the common people. No one knew where you were before you were born, but when you were born, it wasn't long before you found you'd arrived with your return ticket already punched. But wizards really knew. Not if death involved violence or murder, of course, but if the cause of death was simply a case of running out of life, then, well, you knew. You generally got the premonition in time to return your library books and make sure your best suit was clean and borrow quite, a large, quite large sums of money from your friends. He was 130. It occurred to him that for most of his life he'd been an old man. Didn't seem fair, really. And no one had said anything. He'd mentioned it to the in the uncommon room last week, and no one had taken the hint. And at lunch today, they'd hardly spoken to him. Even his so-called friends seemed to be avoiding him, and he wasn't even trying to borrow money. It was like not having your birthday remembered, only worse. He was going to die all alone, and no one cared. He bumped the door open with the wheel of the chair and fumbled on the table by the door for the tinderbox. That was another thing. Hardly anyone used tinderboxes these days. They bought the big, smelly yellow matches the alchemists made. Wendell disapproved. Fire was important. You shouldn't be able to switch it on just like that. It didn't show any respect. That was people these days, always rushing around in fires. Yes, it had been a lot warmer in the old days, too. The kind of fires you had these days didn't warm you up unless you were nearly on top of them. There's something in the wood. It was the wrong sort of wood. Everything was wrong these days. More thin, more fuzzy. No real life in anything. The days were shorter. Mm. Something had gone wrong with the days. They were shorter days. Mm. Every day took an age to go by, which was odd, because the days plural went past like a stampede. There weren't many things people wanted a 130-year-old wizard to do, and Wendell had got into the habit of arriving at the dining table up to two hours before each meal, simply to pass the time. Endless days going by fast. Didn't make sense. Mm. Mind you, it didn't get the sense now that you used to in the old days. And they let the university be run by mere boys now. In the old days, it had been run by proper wizards. Great, big men built like barges. The kinds of wizards you could look up to. Then suddenly they'd all gone off somewhere and Wendell was being patronized by these little boys who still had some of their own teeth. Like that Ridcully lad. Wendell remembered him clearly. Thin lad, sticking out ears, never wiped his nose properly, cried for his mother in the dorm on the first night, always up to mischief. Someone had tried to tell Wendell that Rid Cully was the arch-chancellor now. Hmm, they must think he was daft. Where was that damn tinderbox? Fingers? He used to get proper fingers in the old days. Someone pulled the covers off a lantern. Someone else pushed a drink into his groping hand. Surprise! In the hall of the House of Death is a clock with a pendulum like a blade, but with no hands, because in the House of Death there is no time but the present. There was, of course, a present before the present now, but that was also the present. It was just an older one. The pendulum is a blade that would have made Edgar Allan Poe give it all up and start again as a stand-up comedian on the scampi in a casket circuit. It swings with a faint wom-wom noise, gently slicing thin rashers of interval, from the bacon of eternity. Death stalked past the clock and into the somber gloom of his study. Albert, his servant, was waiting for him with, towel, with the towel and dusters. Good morning, master. 
Death sat down silently in his big chair. Albert draped the towel over the angular shoulders. Another nice day, he said conversationally. Death said nothing. Albert flapped the polishing cloth and pulled back Death's cowl. Albert. Sir? He pulled out the tiny golden timer. Do you see this? Yes, sir. Very nice. Never seen one like, one like that before. Whose is it? Mine. Albert's eyes swiveled sideways. On one corner of Death's desk was a large timer in a black frame. It contained no sand. I thought that one was yours, sir, he said. It was. Now this is a retirement present from Azrael himself. Albert peered at the thing in Death's hand. But the sand, sir, it's pouring. Quite so. But that means, I mean... It means that one day the sand will all be poured, Albert. I know, sir, but you... I thought time was something that happened to other people, sir, doesn't it? Not to you, sir. Uh, by the end of the sentence, Albert's voice was beseeching. Death pulled off the towel and stood up. Come with me. But you're death, master, said Albert, running crab-legged after the tall finger as it led the way out into the hall and down the passage into the stable. This isn't some sort of joke, is it? He added, hopefully. I am not known for my sense of fun. Well, of course not. No offense meant. But listen, you can't die because you're death. You'd have to happen to yourself. And that's like the snake that eats its own tail. Nevertheless, I am going to die. There is no appeal. But what will happen to me? Albert said. Terror glittered on his words like flakes of metal on the edge of a knife. There will be a new death. Albert drew himself up. I really don't think I could serve a new master, he said. Then go back into the world. I will give you money. You have been a good servant, Albert. But if I go back... Yes, said Death. You will die. In the warm, horsey gloom of the stable, Death's pale horse looked up from its oats and gave a little whinny of greeting. The horse's name was Binky. He was a real horse. Death had tried fiery steeds and skeletal horses in the past and found them impractical, especially the fiery ones, which tended to set light to their own bedding and stand in the middle of it looking embarrassed. Death took the saddle down from its hook and glanced at Albert, who was suffering a crisis of conscience. Thousands of years before, Albert had opted to serve Death rather than die. He wasn't exactly immortal. Real time was forbidden in Death's realm. There was only the ever-changing now. But it went on for a very long time. He had less than two months of real time left. He hoarded his days like bars of gold. Uh, I, er, uh, he began, that is... You fear to die? It's not that I don't want... I mean, I've always... It's just that life is a habit that's hard to break. Death watched him curiously, as one might watch a beetle that had landed on its back and couldn't turn over. Finally, Albert lapsed into silence. I understand, said Death, unhooking Binky's bridle. But you don't seem worried. You're really going to die? Yes, it will be a great adventure. It will? You're not afraid? I do not know how to be afraid. I could show you if you like, Albert ventured. No, I should like to learn by myself. I shall have experiences at last. Master, if you go, will there be? A new death will arise from the minds of the living, Albert. Oh, Albert looked relieved. You don't happen to know what he'll be like, do you? No. Perhaps I'd better, you know, clean the place up a bit and get an inventory prepared, uh, that sort of thing? Good idea, said Death, as kindly as possible. When I see the new Death, I shall heartily recommend you. Oh, you'll see him then? Oh, yes, and I must leave now. What, is it so soon? Certainly, mustn't waste time. Death adjusted the saddle and then turned and held the tiny hourglass proudly in front of Albert's hooked nose. See, I have time. At last, I have time. Albert backed away nervously. And now that you have it, what are you going to do with it? He said. Death mounted his horse. I am going to spend it. The party was in full swing. The banner with the legend, 
Goodbye, Windle 100 glorious years was drooping a bit in the heat. Things were getting to the point where there was nothing to drink but the punch and nothing to eat but the strange yellow dip with highly suspicious tortillas and nobody minded. The wizards chatted with the forced jolliness of people who see each other one another all day are now seeing one another all evening. In the middle of it all, Wendell Poon sat with a huge glass of rum and a funny hat on his head. He was almost in tears. A genuine going away party, he kept muttering. Haven't had one of them since old Scratcher Hawksole went away. The capital letters fell into place easily. Back in mm, the year of the intimidating mm, porpoise. Thought everyone had forgotten about them. The librarian looked up the details for us, said the bursar, indicating the large orangutan who was trying to blow into a party squeaker. He also made the banana dip. I hope someone eats it soon. He leaned down. Can I help you to some more potato salad, he said, in a, the loud, deliberate voice used for talking to imbeciles and old people. Wendell cupped a trembling hand to his ear. What? What? More salad, Wendell! Oh, no, thank you. Another sausage, then? What? Sausage! They give me terrible gas all night, said Wendell. He considered for a moment, and then took five. Yeah, shouted the bursar. Do you happen to know what time? Eh? What time? Uh, half past nine, said Wendell, promptly, if indistinctly. Mm, well, that's nice, said the bursar. Gives you the rest of the evening, uh, free. Wendell rummaged in the dreadful recesses of his wheelchair, a graveyard for old cushions, dog-eared books, and ancient half-sucked sweets. He flourished a small green-covered book and pushed it into the bursar's hands. The bursar turned it over, scrawled on the cover were the words, Wendell Poon's His Diary. A piece of bacon rind marked today's date. Under things to do, a crabbed hand had written, Die. The bursar couldn't stop himself from turning the page. Yes, under tomorrow's date, things to do. Get born. His gaze slid sideways to a small table at the side of the room. Despite the fact that the room was quite crowded, there was an area of clear floor around that table, as if it had some kind of personal space that no one was about to invade. There had been special instructions in the going away ceremony concerning the table. It had to have a black cloth with a few magic sigils embroidered on it. It had a plate containing a selection of the better canapes. It had a glass of wine. After considerable discussion with the wizards, a funny paper hat had been added as well. They all had an expectant look. The bursar took out his watch and flicked open the lid. It was one of the newfangled pocket watches with hands. They pointed to a quarter past nine. He shook it. A small hatch opened under the twelve, and a very small demon poked its head out and said, Knock it off, governor! I'm pedaling as fast as I can! He closed the watch again and looked around desperately. No one else seemed anxious to come too near Wendell Poons. The bursar felt it was up to him to make polite conversation. He surveyed possible topics. They all presented problems. Wendell Poons helped him out. Now I'm thinking of coming back as a woman, he said conversationally. The bursar opened and shut his mouth a few times. I'm looking forward to it, Poons went on. I think it might be, mm, be jolly good fun. The bursar riffed. Uh, riffled dis desperately through his limited repertoire of small talk relating to women. He leaned down to Wendell's gnarled ear. Isn't there rather a lot of, he struck out aimlessly, that washing things and making beds and cookery and all that sort of thing? Mm, not the kind of life I have in mind, said Wendell firmly. The bursar shut his mouth. The arch-chancellor banged on a table with a spoon. Brothers, he began when there was something approaching silence. This prompted a loud and ragged chorus of cheering. As you all know, we are here tonight to make the, uh, retirement, nervous laughter, of our old friend and colleague, Wendell Poons. You know, seeing old Wendell sitting here tonight puts me in the mind, as luck would have it, of the story of the cow with three wooden legs. It appears that this, there was this cow, and... The bursar let his mind wander. He knew the story. The Arch-Chancellor always mucked up on the punchline, and in any case, he had other things on his mind. He kept looking back at the little table. The bursar was a kindly, if nervous, soul, and quite enjoyed his job. Apart from anything else, no other wizard wanted it. Lots of wizards wanted to be Arch-Chancellor, for example, or the head of one of the eight orders of magic, 
but practically no wizards wanted to spend lots of time in an office shoveling bits of paper and doing sums. All the paperwork of the university tended to accumulate in the bursar's office, which meant that he went to bed tired at nights, but at least he slept soundly and didn't have to check very hard for unexpected scorpions in his nightshirt. Killing off a wizard of higher grade was a recognized way of getting advancement in the orders. However, the only person likely to want to kill the bursar was someone who else who derived a quiet pleasure from columns of numbers, all neatly arranged, and people like that don't often go in for mur murder. <laughs> At least until the day they suddenly pick up a paper knife and carve their way out through cost accounting and into forensic history. He recalled his childhood long ago in the Ram Top Mountains. He and his sister used to leave a glass of wine and a cake out every hog's watch night for the hog father. Things had been different then. He'd been a lot younger and hadn't known much and had probably been a lot happier. For example, he hadn't known that he might one day be a wizard and join other wizards and leaving a glass of wine and a cake and a rather suspicious a suspect chicken vola vent and a paper party hat for someone else. There'd been hogs watch parties too when he was a little boy. They'd always follow a certain pattern. Just when all the children were nearly sick with excitement, one of the grown-ups would say archly, I think we're going to have a special visitor. And amazingly on cue, there'd be a suspicious ringing of hog bells outside the window and in would come. In would come. The bursar shook his head. Someone's granddad in false whiskers, of course. Some jolly old boy with a sack of toys stamping off in the snow from his boots. Someone who gave you something. Whereas tonight... Of course, old Wendell probably felt different about it. After 130 years, death probably had a certain attraction. He probably became quite interested in finding out what happened next. The Archchancellor's convoluted anecdote wound jerkily to its close. The assembled wizards laughed dutifully and then tried to work out the joke. The bursar looked surreptitiously at his watch. It was now 20 minutes past nine. Wendell Poons made a speech. It was long and rambling and disjointed and went on about the good old days and he seemed to think that most of the people around him were people who had been, in fact, dead for about 50 years, but that didn't matter because you got into the habit of not listening to old Wendell. The bursar couldn't tear his eyes away from the watch. From inside came the squeak of the treadle as the demon patiently pedaled his way toward infinity. Twenty-five minutes past the hour. Then the bursar wondered how it was supposed to happen. Did you hear, I think we're going to have a very special visitor, hoofbeats outside? Did the door actually open, or did he come through it? Silly question. He was renowned for his ability to get into sealed places, especially into sealed places. If you thought about it logically, seal yourself in anywhere and it was only a matter of time. The bursar had hoped he'd use the door properly. His nerves were twanging as it were. The conversational level was dropping. Quite a few other wizards, the bursar noticed, were glancing at the door. Wendell was at the center of a very tactfully widening circle. No one was actually avoiding him. It was just that an apparent random Brownian motion was gently moving everyone away. Wizards can see death. And when a wizard dies, death arrives in person to usher him into the beyond. The bursar wondered why this was considered a plus. Don't know what you're all looking at, said Wendell cheerfully. The bursar opened his watch. The hatch under the twelve snapped up. Can you knock it off with all this shaking around, squeaked the demon? I keeps on losing count. Sorry, the bursar hissed. It was 9.29. The archchancellor stepped forward. Bye then, Wendell, he said, shaking the old man's parchment-like hand. The old place won't seem the same without you. Don't know how we'll manage, said the bursar, thankfully. Good luck in the next life, said the dean. Drop in if you're ever passing and happen to, you know, remember who you've been. Don't be a stranger, you hear, said the Archchancellor. Wendell Poons nodded amiably. He hadn't heard what they were saying. He nodded on general principles. The wizards, as one man, faced the door. The hatch under the twelve snapped up again. Bing, bing, bong, bing, said the demon. Bingly, bing, bong, bing, bong. What? said the bursar, jolted. Half past nine, said the demon. The wizards turned to Wild Wendell Poons. They looked faintly accusing. What are you all looking at, he said. The second's hand on the watch squeaked onward. How are you feeling? Never felt better, said Wendell. Is there any more of that mm, rum left? The assembled wizards watched him pour generous measure into his beaker. You uh, want to go easy on that stuff, said the dean nervously. 
Good health, said Wendell Poons. The Arch-Chancellor drummed his fingers on the table. Uh, Mr. Poons, he said, are you quite sure? Wendell had gone off on a tangent. Any more of these, uh, uh, torturillas? Now that I call it proper food, he said, dipping bits of hard bicky and sludge. What's so special about that? I could, uh, do right now with one of Mr. Dibbler's famous meat pies. And then he died. The Arch-Chancellor glanced at his fellow wizards and then tiptoed across to the wheelchair and lifted a blue-veined wrist to check the pulse. He shook his head. That's the way I want to go, said the dean. What, muttering about meat pies? Said the bursar. No, late. Hold on, hold on, said the Arch-Chancellor. This isn't right, you know. According to a tra tradition, death himself turns up for the death of a wizard. Uh, perhaps he was busy, said the bursar hurriedly. That's right, said the dean. Bit of a serious flu epidemic over in Quirm, I'm way I've told. Uh, quite a storm last night, too. Lots of shipwrecks, I dare say, said the lecturer in recent runes. And, of course, it's springtime when you get a great many avalanches in the mountains. And plagues! The arch-chancellor stroked his beard thoughtfully. Hmm, he said. Alone of all the creatures in the world, trolls believe that all living things go through time backward. If the past is visible and the future is hidden, they say, then it means you must be facing the wrong way. Everything alive is going through life back to front. And this is a very interesting idea, considering it was invented by a race who spend most of their times hitting one another in the head with rocks. Whichever way around it is, time is something living creatures possess. Death galloped down through the towering black clouds. And now he had time, too. The time of his life. Wendell Poons peered into the darkness. Hello, he said. Hello, anyone there? What ho? There was a distant forlorn sowing as of wind at the end of a tunnel. Come out, come out, wherever you are, said Wendell, his voice trembling with mad cheerfulness. Don't worry, I'm quite looking forward to it, to tell the truth. He clapped his hands, spiritual hands, and rubbed them together with forced enthusiasm. <sighs> Get a move on. Some of us have got new lives to go to, he said. The darkness remained inert. There was no shape, no sound. It was a void without form. The spirit of Wendell Poons moved on in the face of the darkness. It shook its head. Ah, blow this for a lark, it muttered. This isn't right at all. <laughs> it hung around for a while, and then, because it didn't seem anything else for it, headed for the only home it had ever known. <laughs> it was a home he'd occupied for 130 years. It wasn't expecting him back, and put up quite a lot of resistance. You either had to be very determined or very powerful to overcome that sort of thing. But Wendell Poods had been a wizard for more than a century. Besides, it was like breaking into your own house, the old familiar property that you lived in for years. You knew where the metaphorical window that didn't shut properly. In short, Wendell Poons went back to Wendell Poons. Wizards don't believe in gods in the same way that most people don't find it necessary to believe in, say, tables. They know they're there. They know that they're there for a purpose. They'd probably agree that they have a place in a well-organized universe, but they wouldn't see the point of believing, of going around saying, Oh, great table without whom we are as not. <laughs> anyway, either the gods are there, whether you believe it or not, or exist only as a function of belief, so either way, you might as well ignore the whole business and, as it were, eat off your knees. Nevertheless, there is a small chapel off in the university's great hall, because while wizards stand right behind the philosophy as outlined above, you don't become a successful wizard by getting up God's noses, even if those noses only exist in an ethereal or metaphorical sense. Because while wizards don't believe in gods, they know for a fact that gods believe in gods. And in this chapel lay the body of Wendell Poons. The university had instituted 24 hours lying in state ever since the embarrassing affair 30 years previously with the late Pristle Mary Prankster Titar. The body of Wendell Poons opened its eyes. Two coins jingled onto the stone floor. The hands crossed over the chest, unclenched. Wendell raised his head. Some idiot had stuck a lily on his stomach. His eyes swiveled sideways. There was a candle on either side of his head. He raised his head some more. There were two more candles down there, too. <sighs> Thank goodness for old Titar, he thought. Otherwise, I'd already be looking up at the underside of a rather cheap pine lid. Funny thing, he thought. I'm thinking, clearly. Wow. Wendell lay back, feeling his spirit refilling his body like a gleaming molten metal running across a mold. 
White hot thoughts seared across the darkness of his brain, fired sluggish neurons into action. It was never like this when I was alive, but I'm not dead. Not alive and not dead. Sort of none alive or undead. Oh dear. He swung himself upright. Muscles that hadn't worked properly for 70 or 80 years jerked into overdrive. For the first time in his entire life, he corrected himself. Better make that a uh, period of existence. Wendell Poons' body was entirely under Wendell Poons' control, and Wendell Poons' spirit wasn't about to take lip from a bunch of muscles. Now the body stood up. The knee joints resisted for a while, but they were no more able to withstand the onslaught of willpower than a sick mosquito can withstand a blowtorch. The door to the chapel was locked. However, Wendell found the mirror's pressure was enough to pull the lock out of the woodwork and leave fingerprints in the metal of the door handle. Oh, goodness, he said. He piloted himself out into the corridor. The distant clatter of cutlery and the buzz of voices suggested that one of the university's four daily meals was in progress. He wondered whether you were allowed to eat when you were dead. Probably not, he thought. And could he eat anyway? It wasn't that he wasn't hungry, it was just that... Well, he knew how to think, and walking and moving were just a matter of twitching some fairly obvious nerves, but how exactly did your stomach work? It began to dawn on Wendell that the human body is not run by the brain, despite the brain's opinion on the matter. In fact, it's run by dozens of complex automatic systems, all whirring and clicking away with the kind of precision that isn't noticed until it breaks down. He surveyed himself from the control room of his skull. He looked at the silent chemical factory of his liver with the same sinking feeling as a canoe builder might survey the controls of a computerized supertanker. The mysteries of his kidneys awaited Wendell's mastery of renal control. What, when you got right down to it, was a spleen? And how did you make it go? His heart sank, or rather, it didn't. Oh, gods, muttered Wind Wendell and leaned against the wall. How did it work now? He prodded a few likely-looking nerves. Was it systolic, diastolic, systolic, diastolic? And then there was the lungs, too. Like a conjurer keeping 18 plates spinning at the same time, like a man trying to program a video recorder from an instruction manual translated from Japanese into Dutch by a Korean rice husker, like, in fact, a man finding out what total self-control really means, Wendell Poons lurched onward. The wizards of the Unseen University set great st store by big, solid meals. A man couldn't be expected to get down to serious wizarding they held without soup, fish, game, several huge plates of meat, a pie or two, something big and wobbly with cream on it, little savory things on toast, fruit, nuts, and a brick-thick mint with coffee. Gave him a lining to his stomach. It was also important that the meals were served at regular times. It was what gave the day shape, they said. <laughs> Except for the bursar, of course. He didn't eat much, but lived on his nerves. He was certain he was anorectic, because every time he looked in the mirror, he saw a fat man. It was the arch-chancellor standing behind him and shouting at him. And it was the bursar's unfortunate fate to be sitting opposite the doors when Wendell Poon smashed them in because it was easier than fiddling with the handles. He bit through his wooden spoon. The wizards revolved on their benches to stare. Wendell Poon swayed for a moment, assembling control of the vocal cords, lips, and tongue, and then said, I think I may be able to metabolize alcohol. <sighs> the Arch-Chancellor was the first one to recover. Wendell, he said, we thought you were dead. He had to admit that it wasn't a very good line. You didn't put people on a slab with candles and lilies all around them because you think they've got a bit of a headache and want a nice lie down for half an hour. Wendell took a few steps forward. The nearest wizards fell over themselves in an effort to get away. I am dead, you bloody young fool, he muttered. Think I go around looking like this all the time? Good grief, he glared at the assembled wizardry. Anyone here know what a spleen is supposed to do? He reached the table and managed to sit down. Probably something to do with digestion, he said. Funny thing, you can go your whole life with the bloody thing ticking away or whatever it does gurgling or whatever, and you never know what the hell it's actually for. It's like when you're lying in bed in the night and you hear your stomach or something going like, drawing. It's like a gurgle to you, but who knows what kind of marvelously complex chemical exchange processes are really going on. You're an undead, said the bursar, managing to get the words out at last. I didn't ask to be, said the late Wendell Poons, irritably, looking at the food and wondering how in the blazes one went to turning it into Wendell Poons. <laughs> 
I only came back because there was nowhere else to go. Think I want to be here? But surely, said the Arch-Chancellor, didn't you know the fella, the one with the skull and the scythe? Never saw him, said Wendell shortly, inspecting the nearest dishes. Really takes it out of you, this undying. The wizards made frantic signals to one another over his head. They looked up and glared at them. And don't think I can't see all them frantic signals, he said. And he was amazed to realize that this was true. Eyes that had viewed the past 60 years through a pale, fuzzy veil had been bullied into operating like the finest optical machinery. In fact, two main bodies of thought were occupying the minds of the wizards of the Unseen University. What was being thought by most of the wizards was, This is terrible. Is it really old Wendell in here? He was such a sweet old buffer. How can we get rid of it? How can we get rid of it? What was being thought by Wendell Poons on the humming, flashing cockpit of his brain was, Well, it's true. There is life after death. And it's the same one. Just my luck. Well, he said, what are you going to do about it? It was five minutes later. Half a dozen of the most senior wizards scurried along the drafty corridors in the wake of the Arch-Chancellor, whose robes billowed out behind him. The conversation went like this. It's got to be Wendell. It even talks like him. It's not old Wendell. Old Wendell was a lot older. Older? Older than dead? He said he wants his old bedroom back, and I don't see why I should have to move out. Did you see his eyes? Like gimlets. Eh? What? What do you mean? You mean like that dwarf who runs the delicatessen on Cable Street? I mean like they bore into you. It's got a lovely view of the gardens, and I've had all my stuff moved in there, and it's not fair. Has this ever happened before? Well, there was old Titar. Yes, but he never actually died. He just used to put on green face paint and, uh face and push the lid off the coffin and shout surprise surprise never had a zombie here he's a zombie i think so does that mean he'll be playing kettle drums and doing the bimbo dancing all night then is that what they do old wendell doesn't sound like his cup of tea he never liked dancing so much when he was alive anyway you can't trust those voodoo gods never trust a god who grins all the time and wears a top hat that's my motto I'm damned if I'm going to give up my bedroom to a zombie after waiting years for it. Is it? That's a funny motto. Wendell Poon strolled around the inside of his own head again. Strange thing, this. Now he was dead, or not living anymore, whatever he was, his mind felt clearer than it had ever done. And control seemed to be getting easier, too. He hardly had to bother about the whole respiratory thing. The spleen seemed to be working after a fashion. The senses were operating at full speed. The digestive system was still a bit of a mystery, though. He looked at himself in a silver plate. He still looked dead. Pale face, red under the eyes, a dead body, operating but still basically dead. Was that fair? Was that justice? Was that a proper reward for being a firm believer in reincarnation for almost 130 years? You come back as a corpse? No wonder the undead were traditionally considered to be very angry. Something wonderful, if you took the long view, was about to happen. If you took the short or medium view, something horrible was about to happen. It's, the, it's like the difference between seeing a beautiful new star in the winter sky and actually being close to the supernova. It's the difference between the beauty of morning dew on a cobweb and actually being a fly. It, it was something that wouldn't normally have happened for thousands of years. It was about to happen now. It was about to happen at the back of a disused cupboard in the tumble-down cellar in the shades, the oldest and most disreputable part of Ankh-Mapork. Plop. It was a sound as soft as the first drop of rain on a century of dust. Maybe we could get a black cat to walk across his coffin. He hasn't got a coffin, wailed the bursar who, with his grip on sanity, was always slightly tentative. Okay, so we buy him a nice new coffin... And then we get a black cat to walk across it. No, that's stupid. We have to make him pass water. What? Uh, pass water. Undead can't do it. The wizards who had crowded into the Arch-Chancellor's study gave this statement their full, fascinated attention. Uh, you sure? Well-known fact, said the lecturer in recent runes flatly. He used to pass water all the time when he was alive, said the dean doubtfully. Not when he's dead, though. Yeah, makes sense. Running water, said the lecturer in recent runes suddenly. It's running water. Sorry, they can't cross over it. Well, I can't cross running water either, said the dean. Undead! Undead! The bursar was becoming a little unglued. Now stop teasing him, said the lecturer, patting the trembling man on the back. Well, I can't, said the dean. I sink. 
Undead can't cross running water even on a bridge. Mm, and is he the only one, eh? Are we gonna have a plague of them then, eh? Said the lecturer. The Arch-Chancellor drummed his fingers on his desk. Dead people walking around is unhygienic, he said. This silenced them. No one had ever looked at it that way, but Mustrum Ridcully was just the sort of man who would. Mustrum Ridcully was, depending on your point of view, either the worst or the best Arch-Chancellor that Unseen University had had for a hundred years. There was just too much of him, for one thing. It wasn't that he was particularly big, it was just that he had the kind of huge personality that fit any available space. He'd get roaring drunk at supper, and that was fine and acceptable, wizardly behavior, but then he'd go back to his room and play darts all night long, and then leave at five in the morning to go duck hunting. He shouted at people, he liked to, to jolly them along, and he hardly ever wore proper robes. He'd persuaded Miss Whitlow, the university's dreaded housekeeper, to make him a sort of baggy trouser suit in garish blue and red. Twice a day, the wizards stood in bemusement and watched him jog purposefully around the university buildings, his pointy wizarding hat tied firmly on his head with a string. He'd shout cheerfully up at them because fundam fundamental to the makeup of people like Mustrum Ridcully is the iron belief that everyone else would like it too, if only they tried it. Maybe he'll die, they told one another, hopefully, as they watched him try to break the crust on the river Ankh for an early morning dip. All this healthy exercise can't be good for him. Stories trickled back into the university. The Arch-Chancellor had gone two rounds bare-fisted with Detritus, the huge odd-job troll at the mended drum. The Arch-Chancellor had arm-wrestled with the librarian for a bet, and although, of course, he hadn't won, he still had his arm afterward. The Arch-Chancellor wanted the university to form its own football team for the big city game on Hogswatch Day. Intellectually, Ridcully maintained his position for two reasons. One was that he never, ever changed his mind about anything. The other was that it took him several minutes to understand any new idea put to him, and this is a very valuable trait in a leader, because anything anyone is still trying to explain to you after two minutes is probably important, and anything they give up after a mere minute or so is almost certainly something they shouldn't have been bothering you with in the first place. There seemed to be more Mustroom Ridcully than one body could reasonably contain. Plop, plop. In the dark cupboard in the cellar, a whole shelf was already full. There was exactly as much Wendell Poons as one body could contain, and he steered it carefully along the corridors. I never expected this, he thought. I don't deserve this. There's been a mistake somewhere. He felt a cool breeze on his face and realized he tottered out into the open air. Ahead of him were the university's gates, locked shut. Suddenly, Wendell Poons felt acutely claustrophobic. He'd waited years to die, and now that he had... And here he was, stuck in this, this mausoleum with a lot of daft old men, where he'd have to spend the rest of his life being dead. Well, the first thing to do was to get out and make proper end to himself. Evening, Mr. Poons. He turned around very slowly and saw the small figure of Moto, the university's dwarf gardener, who was sitting on the twilight, in the twilight, smoking his pipe. Oh, hello, Moto. I heard you took dead, Mr. Poons. Uh, yes, I was. See, you got over, then. Boons nodded and looked dismally around the walls. The university gates were always locked at sunset and every evening, obliging students and staff to climb over the walls. He doubted very much that he'd be able to manage that. He clenched and unclenched his hands. Oh well. Is there any other gateway around here, Moto? He said. No, Mr. Poons. Uh, well, where shall we have one? Sorry, Mr. Poons? There was the sound of tortured masonry followed by a vaguely poons-shaped hole in the wall. Wendell's hand reached out and picked up his hat. Moto relit his pipe. You see a lot of interesting things in this job, he thought. In an alley temporarily out of sight of passerby, someone called Reg Shu, who was dead, looked both ways, took a brush and a paint tin out of his pocket, and painted on the wall in the words, Dead, yes, gone, no, and ran away, or at least lurch off, at a high speed. The Arch-Chancellor opened a window onto the night. Listen, he said. The wizards listened. A dog barked. Somewhere a thief whistled and was answered from a neighboring rooftop. In the distance, a couple were having a kind of quarrel that causes most of the surrounding streets to open their windows and listen and make notes. But these were only major themes against the continuous hum and buzz of the city. 
Ankhmapork purred through the night, en route for the dawn, like a huge living creature, although, of course, this was only a metaphor. Well, said the senior wrangler, I can't hear anything special. That's what I mean. Dozens of people die in Ankhmapork every day. If they'd all started coming back like a uh, poor old Wendell, don't you think we'd know about it? This place would be in an uproar. More uproar than usual, I mean. There's always a few undead around, said the dean, hopefully. Vampires and zombies and banshees and so on. Hey, yes, but they're more naturally undead, said the Archchancellor. They know how to carry it off. They're born into it. You can't be born into the undead, the senior wrangler pointed out. The post of senior wrangler was an unusual one, as was the name itself. In some of the centers of learning, the senior wrangler is a leading philosopher. In others, he's barely someone who looks after horses. The senior wrangler at the Unseen University was a philosopher who looked like a horse, thus neatly encapsulating all definitions. I mean, it's traditional, the Archchancellor snapped. There were some very respectable vampires where I grew up. They had been in their family for centuries. Uh, yes, but they drink blood, said the senior wrangler. That doesn't sound very respectable to me. I read that they don't actually need... No, they don't need the actual blood, said the dean, anxious to assist. They're just... They just need something that's in the blood. Hemogoblins, I think it's called. The other wizards looked at him. The dean shrugged. Search me, he said. Hemogoblins. That's what it said. It's all got to do with my people having iron in their blood. I'm damn sure I got no iron goblins in my blood, said the senior wrangler. At least they're better than zombies, said the dean. A much better class of people. Vampires don't go shuffling around the whole time. People can be turned into zombies, you know, said the lecturer of recent runes in conversational tones. You don't even need magic. Just the liver of a certain rare fish and the extract of a particular kind of root. Mm, one spoonful, and when you wake up, you're a zombie. What type of fish, said the senior wrangler. How should I know? How should anyone know then, said the senior wrangler nastily. Did someone wake up one morning and say, hey, here's an idea. I'll just turn someone into a zombie. All I need is some rare fish liver and a piece of root. It's just a matter of finding the right one, yeah? You can see the queue outside the hut, can't you? Number 94 red striped fish liver and the maniac root. No, didn't work. Number 95 spiked fish liver and dum dum root. Didn't work. Number nine. What are you talking about? The arch chancellor demanded. I was simply pointing out the intrinsic unlikelihood of, uh, shut up, said the Arch Chancellor matter of factly. Seems to me, seems to me, look, death must be going on, right? Death has to happen. That's what being alive is all about. You're alive and then you're dead. It can't just stop happening. But he didn't turn up for Windle, the Dean pointed out. It goes on all the time, said Ridcully, ignoring him. All sorts of things die all the time, even vegetables. Uh, but I don't think death ever came for a potato, said the dean doubtfully. Death comes for everything, said the arch-chancellor firmly. The wizards nodded sagely. After a while, the senior wrangler said, Do you know I read the other day that every atom in your body is changed every seven years? New ones keep getting attached and old ones keep dropping off. Goes on all the time. Marvelous, really. The senior wrangler could do a, a converse, due to a conversation what it takes quite a thick treacle to do to the petals of a precision watch. Yes, what happens to the old ones, said Ridcully, interested despite himself. Nah, I don't know. They just float around in the air, I suppose, until they get attached to someone else. The Arch-Chancellor looked affronted. What, even wizards? Oh yes, everyone. That's a part of the miracle of existence. Is it? Sounds like bad hygiene to me, said the Arch-Chancellor. Suppose there's no way of stopping it. I shouldn't think so, said the senior wrangler doubtfully. I don't think you're supposed to stop miracles of existence. But that means everything is made up of everything else, said Ridcully. Yes, isn't it amazing? It's disgusting is what it is, said Ridcully shortly. <sighs> anyway, the point I'm making, the point I'm making, he paused trying to remember, you can't just abolish death. That's the point. Death can't die. That's like asking a scorpion to sting itself. As a matter of fact, said the senior wrangler, always ready with a handy fact, you can get a scorpion to... Shot up, said the arch-chancellor. But we can't have an undead wizard wandering around, said the dean. There's no telling what he might take it into his head to do. We've got to put a stop to him for his own good. That's right, said Ridcully, for his own good. Shouldn't be too hard. There must be dozens of ways to deal with the undead. 
Garlic, said the senior wrangly flatly. Undead don't like garlic. Don't blame him. Can't stand the stuff, said the dean. Undead! Undead! said the bursar, pointing an accusing finger. They ignored him. Yeah, and then there's the sacred items, said the senior wrangler. And your basic undead crumbles into dust as soon as they look at him. And they don't like daylight. And if the worst comes to worse, you can bury him at crossroads. That's a surefire, that is. And if you stick a stake in them to make sure they don't get up again. With garlic on it, said the bursar. Ah, uh, well, yes, I, I guess you could put garlic on it, said the senior wrangler, reluctantly. I don't think you should put garlic on a good steak, said the dean. Just a little oil and seasoning. Uh, red pepper is nice, said the lecturer in recent runes. Happily. Shut up, said the arch-chancellor. Plop. The cupboard's hinges, door's hinges finally gave way, spilling its contents into the room. And I think that's where we'll finish up for now. That's about 45 pages in, which means we should be on track to finishing this in about 10 sessions. But yeah. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here and joining me for uh, the start of a new reading of Reaper Man by Terry Pratchett. I hope you guys enjoyed the previous one and that you keep enjoying uh, these readings going forward. So I will catch you guys on the next part of Reaper Man.